بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد Welcome to our weekly book club where we are looking together at the Joy Jots Exercises for a Happy Heart book. This book has 52 essays, one a week for a whole year of exercises for a happy heart. And it has two introductions, which we talked about before, but I just want to encourage you all, if you have the book, to read the introductions because they are, well, to be honest, because they're important to me. It's uh, This book came out of places of a lot of emotional vulnerability, a lot of grief, and yet it's called Joy Jot. So it is important to me that you have some understanding of the foundational um, thinking, I guess, behind the book. So read the introductions for that. And uh, one more thing is when you order the book, do try to order it from daybreak.rabota.org because that supports the work at rabota.org uh, much, much more than ordering it anywhere else. All right. Bismillah. Okay. So week eight is grievances, grudges, and spiritual standstill. And this is just such an important chapter for me. Uh, it's really the um, the essence of looking at the heart is figuring out what we've got going on in there. Uh, last week, in one of the classes that I taught at the Islamic Seminary of America, I, I'm teaching a class about contemporary fiqh, and we talked about mental health in that class. And in the class about mental health, we talked about many different things, many, many different things. And um, for those of you who want to follow up, up where I teach and join my classes, the majority of my classes are taught at the Ribat Institute. That's by women for women. And you can sign up for my classes still. And I'm teaching four classes there this semester. I'm teaching one about knowing your audience, one about the companions, and one about uh, beginning Aqidah, it's called Foundation Flounderings in Faith. And the other one is Aqidah Level 2 class. I also teach at TISA at least once a semester. And uh, there I am teaching in tandem with another professor, a class called Contemporary Fiqh. So in these two classes, knowing your audience, and then also in this course where we had one session on mental health, there's a lot of, I put a lot of thought into what does it mean to grow into a healthy person? And this chapter is about the really quite serious issue of what happens when we have a lot of grudges in our heart. And it's something I've been back thinking about again, actually. I've been thinking about it, not only about myself, I think we should always think about it about ourselves, but what happens when others hold grudges against us? That's also, it's a, it's a heavy burden to bear. And it's, a, it's something to, to think about. But right now, this particular chapter is about how do we manage our hearts. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as mentioned in the Quran, in, uh, sorry, as mentioned in the book, he says in the Quran, in uh, Ali Amran, verse 134, <laughs> Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen. These are is a series of instructions to believers. And it's a very eye-opening and heart-opening verse with a lot of instruction in it that we can think about. In English, the believers are those who... Sp the believers is from a different... Uh, the verse before, but they are those who spend during ease and hardship. And who... Uh, uh, restrain anger and who pardon people. So much, and not only, not the whole verse, just that little section of the verse. So these are qualities of the people of Ihsan. Together, those equal, like one plus one equals two. Those equal a heart that isn't bitter. A heart that isn't bitter. So how do we work on hearts that are not bitter? How do we do it? 
How do we get to that place where our heart is not bitter anymore? Ali Amran, verse 134. It's such an issue for so many of us, really, that we are in a place of bitterness. And I don't know what to say. Like, it's hard, you know. I don't want to, I want to just be real with you and say it's hard. If you're angry, if you've been hurt, you've been harmed, you've been oppressed in one way or another, it's not easy to just say, oh, okay, all right, I'm going to be Kathy Min al I'm going to control that temper, and I'm going to be forgiving of people. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that this is important. And we see in the Prophet's life, even in Bilal's life, this is a story that's not mentioned in this chapter, I don't think. No, it isn't. But I'm going to share this story that just astounds me. Bilal alayhi salam, he was a incredible companion, really. We know a lot about him from sort of the folk stories that we hear about him. The the Ahad, Ahad, endurance of oppression, and then, of course, being given the role of the first Mu'adhan, to the degree that in Singapore and Malaysia, the Mu'adhan is called the Bilal. Super cool, I think, or in Indonesia, maybe it is, too. Anyway, so something about Bilal is that when he was in Medina, in those early days, and he was going to call the Adhan, he was a he was in a situation where he was waiting okay so he would go to a place to wait and pray and wait for the adhan so he could send wait for a fajr so he could call it and he was in at the top level of a house of a woman there who reports about what he would do and say while he was waiting to call the adhan and I've talked about this story before. Some of you may have heard me talk about it as far as talking about the importance of Tahajjud and how here he is praying Tahajjud, etc. But I want to focus on something else right now. Bilal was making dua for Quraysh. Making dua for Quraysh. Can you imagine? I mean, I think about that. And I know he loved the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So... I know that that love for the Prophet certainly helped with this. You know, like, I love the Prophet and he loves the, these people. And so I want them to be guided so that we, so that the Prophet can be pleased. I get that peace. I get that love. I get that love. But, but how did he stand aside from his own, ink, his own heart? Did he? Was he not filled with bitterness and anger towards everything they had done? If he wasn't, why not? And how did he reach that place? How did he get to that place where he wasn't saying to himself, Ha! Huh, the Quraysh? <laughs> Let Allah do with them what Allah wills. Uh, they were horrible to me. They did this, they did that. No, he wanted their guidance. Both, but especially forgiving of people. Sometimes maybe we think that to be forgiving of people is to, to remove them from responsibility. Maybe our, we feel like we're fueling our anger by remaining angry. We're not. SubhanAllah. And, you know, this, I used to talk a lot about this phrase, having coffee and tea with our bitter feelings only hurts us. What do I mean by having coffee and tea with our bitter feelings? Somebody hurt you. Listen, let me tell you something. This is the nature of the world. People will hurt us. They will. And it's not only going to be people that are quote unquote bad people. I believe we've been taught somehow that good people will not hurt us and bad people will hurt us. No, no, no. We will be hurt, our feelings will be hurt, and we will be disappointed by good people too. And oftentimes unintentionally, when it's uh, something really severe, that, that's a different, but in the day-to-day -day interactions with people, a good person can do something that hurts your feelings. Unintentionally, maybe thoughtlessly, maybe they didn't think about it. For whatever reason but and the more interaction you have with people the more risk you're taking of hurting their feelings 
So then what? What do we do? Like, do we, do we hold on to that, those feelings and, and sit there and have coffee and tea with them until they grow into a monster inside of us? And then with that monster inside of us, we are, we are filled with anger and ugly. That's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. وَالْعَافِينَ عَنَ النَّاسِ To be forgiving of people. One of the other stories that just blows my mind is the story of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and his daughter Aisha. I'm, I'm saying it this way because I want to tell the story of Abu Bakr from Abu Bakr's side radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr was the father, as we know, of Aisha radiallahu anhu. And during the ifik, the trial where Aisha was accused of of uh, terrible sin, uh, that he was, I just want you to imagine how hurt he must have been as her father. Think about you as a parent. Do you get more upset when somebody hurts you or if somebody hurts your kids? I mean, somebody could say all sorts of things to me, but if they just say to one of my kids, your, your hair is uncombed or your your feet are not straight or whatever. I'm going to be all over. I'm going to be really upset. So my kids. So imagine how Abu Bakr felt that his daughter. And so there was one of his relatives was actually one of the members of those who were spreading the terrible gossip and slander, literally spreading gossip and slander about his daughter. And this relative was a relative that Abu Bakr supported. He gave him money on the regular to take care of him. And so after the whole problem was resolved, Abu Bakr was like, I'm not giving him money anymore. Now, wouldn't we all say, ha, he has a right? This is, of course, of course, why would he give, of course, literally talk about toxic people. We talk about toxic people and manipulative people and having to protect ourselves from toxic people, etc. Well, what about this person literally was part of a toxic community plot against the his his very daughter. And with that, his beautiful friend who was the prophet of his religion, Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is very severe, severe uh, actions. This is not just not being invited to a wedding. And sometimes you hear me say that and I maybe you think I'm making light of it, but I know that it can be hurtful to feel left out. It can. I know it can be hurtful to feel left out. I know it can be hurtful to feel like you're not important to people you thought you were important to. It's hurtful. I know that. But in the scheme of things, even that is not the same as this terrible trial to Abu Bakr. And so he said, I'm not giving him money anymore. And I think all of us would say, yeah, Absolutely, that makes 100% sense. And we would encourage our friends not to do it. Yes, that's a toxic person. You, They do not deserve your money anymore, etc. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Jalla Jalalu, revealed a verse about this decision. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. It's really just amazing. And the verse is in, let me see, Surah 24, verse 22, if you want to look it up. وَلَا يَأْتِ لِأُولُوا الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ وَالسَّاعَةِ أَنْ يُؤْتُوا أُولِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْيَعْفُوا وَالْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ in English, and let not those of virtue among you and wealth swear not to give aid to their relatives and the needy and the immigrants, the muhajirin who, who went, who did their immigration for Allah. Then there's a question, it's a rhetorical question. أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ would you not like that Allah would forgive you? Don't you want Allah to forgive you? Aha. Wallahu ghafoor rahim. 
This is just, it blows me away. Abu Bakr, who was so hurt, is being called upon to put that hurt aside and to continue to care for his needy Muhajir relative. And he's, he's also being asked, as we all are being asked here, Ala tuhibbuna. Would you not tuhibbuna? Would you would you not love maybe? Ayyaghfir Allahu lakum. Wouldn't you love for Allah to forgive you? I want Allah to forgive me. I need Allah to forgive me. It feels like it's a question that is linked to our ability to forgive others. And so we have to ask ourselves. Where is my heart and what can I do to change my heart, to remove the bitterness, to remove the grudges from my heart? What can I do? Subhanallah. I, and you know, each of us is going to answer that question differently. For some people, it will be spiritual work, literally sitting down and doing spiritual work on the heart. For others, it may be therapeutic visits to talk about what's happening and to, to learn how to use skills that you might learn in therapy to move beyond that pain. For others, it may be just sitting down and having a conversation. We say dhikr and fikr. It may be fikr. It may be sitting down and having some, thinking it through and reminding ourselves of how much we need Allah to forgive us and so moving our way from the hurt and pain that someone has caused us. For others, it may be du'a. One of the ways to get rid of grudges is to make du'a for the person who hurts you. Tough stuff. But, but possible. And yes, it is hard to see past our pain sometimes. But these are some different tools. Dhikr, fikr, du'a. Talking with a professional. All of these are, are ways to help us. But we have to put it on project level. We have to realize that it's really important. As long as we are enjoying our bitterness, as long as our bitterness gives us fuel and strength, it's really scary that thought, you know? That our grudges, our bitterness might be something that is fueling our energy, our bitterness, our grudges fueling us that's not the energy we want that's satanic satanic energy that's shaitanic energy let's all say it together we just don't want that you know we just don't want that and and as i say that let's think about iblis the book does mention i hope you've read the chapter so you're, you're working on that with me the chapter talks about how holding grudges is a direct and clear quality of Iblis. He's the original grudge holder. He is literally the original grudge holder. He's the king of grudge holders. He resented our status with Allah. Azzawajal. And refused to bow down before us. SubhanAllah. And when Allah questioned him about this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the opportunity to seek forgiveness. But mm -mm. instead, he didn't seek forgiveness. He sought a way, and he didn't seek a way to fix his mistake. Instead, he let the bitter, burning resentment build within, and his only request was to take us down with him. I'm reading from the book. His only request was to take us down with him. La ilaha illallah. May Allah protect us from such grudges and such resentment and such internal ugliness. Ugliness. And how does he take us down with him? By dragging us down on that grudge road, that bitterness road. That road where we, can't, that we can never forget little things that people do. Or things that people do that are even bigger. And of course here I'm talking about ourselves as the victim of other people's hurtful things. La ilaha illallah. But think about how this breaks up relationships. Think about how this gives victory to shaitan. 
when grudges are followed up and and uh, grow in the heart, they always end up in an explosion. At which time, if there's too much of it, it will ruin that relationship. We can refuse that. We can refuse to listen to shaitan. We can refuse to be bitter. We can reach. We can choose joy. We can choose forgiveness. We can choose to walk in the footsteps of Bilal alayhi salam, Abu Bakr alayhi salam, Aisha radiallahu anha. Sorry, also Bilal and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhum. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with all of them and send peace upon all of our ancestors. We can do better. We can do better for the sake of our ummah, for the sake of ourselves too, our own personal lives, for the sake of this work, for the sake of changing who we are, and really, actually, for a selfish reason too, for the reason of being happy. This is a religion that opens up the door to happiness. It really does. It, with all of its teachings, it opens up the door to happiness for every individual Muslim as well as our communities. We just have to walk through that door. And this week, we're talking about making sure that we're not slamming that door in our own faces by carrying bitterness and grudges. And we have a question, which I will move to in just a moment. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and move to the question right now because I was just going to talk about the reflection and the project this week. And by the way, thank you to those of you who were tweeting about Joy Jots. It was so much fun. That homework where you were tweeting about Joy Jots and um, hashtagging, and sorry, and adding me so that I could see. It was so much fun. And also the hashtag joy jot so that I could see what your joy jots were. It was really fun. So thanks for doing that. But yeah, so Tanil asks, how do we focus on our own actions instead of on the hurt being aimed at us? I do make dua for those who have harmed me, but the resentment is still there. Let's look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Abu Bakr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran is speaking, of course, Abu Bakr, but to all of us and saying, all right, do not swear to not help. So first of all, we don't, we don't, want to swear that we're not going to help or speak to or be part of the lives of any of our relatives or needy or community people who have hurt us. Okay? That's number one. Now, uh, on the other hand, the second thing is, uh, So the next thing is, okay, we ask ourselves, don't, do we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us? And we say, yes, I do. <laughs> most certainly I do. So we work on that thought and think, okay, I really need Allah to forgive me for a thousand things. Can I work on my heart to forgive this person for this thing? Allah, so having that fikir time, that time of reflection is really important. It will help. It will help. I also really think you have to talk to people too and learn and learn to have empathy for the person. Like the person who hurt you, why they hurt you? First of all, maybe, maybe, it, maybe they did something you, someone told you they did, but they never did. Don't believe everything people tell tell you. And sometimes there are and people tell you things because they saw a piece of it. Sometimes they tell you things because they are addicted to drama. Sometimes they might tell you things because they are purposely trying to feed you stuff so that you can get emotional with them and you can be attached to them. So don't believe everything you hear about other people. That's number one. And number two is if if it's something that you, like it happened to you and you know it, think about what are your excuses for them? What, what was that person going through when they said that to you? Did they have COVID when they yelled at you? Maybe it was COVID speaking. Did they have, um, have they been in the house? Had they been in the house for six months without going out? Are they going through their own mental health issues? Are they under a lot of stress? Are they under, you know, learn how to be forgiving because of, their life situation. Talk to yourself. Talk to yourself about where they are. As you would like people to understand that that was a bad day for you that day, that you had an outburst, understand the same for others. And the the third thing is I really do recommend therapy. Um, remember that shay this is a place for shaitan. So here's these are two things. Sorry, I'm mixing them up. Oh, let me not mix them up. Number one, I do recommend therapy. I do think that um, talking to someone who's a Third person can help you with certain CBT and DBT skills to learn how to interact, especially if you deal with manipulative people and a lot. 
or toxic people that you cannot just say, and, and you're going to follow this and you're going to say, okay, I'm not just going to cut them out of my life. I'm going to learn how to interact with them. You want to get those skills from a professional. And the third thing is remember, or the fourth thing, remember that this is the road of shaitan. Like you're opening the door wide and saying, come on in. When shaitan enters our lives, his first goal is to break up relationships, to break up friend relationships, to break up, to hurt your heart towards other people. So remember that so that you, you realize that in too much coffee and tea with your bitterness, you're actually responding to shaitan instead of responding to to the to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's direction for us, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. And so I also see, yeah, it can be from their own trauma, yeah, that they're not ready to face, absolutely, or community trauma or all sorts of things that are possible. Yep, and don't assume exactly. Okay, so yeah, subhanAllah. All right, so let's look for a minute at what the book has to say about reflection points and projects. The reflection point, the project is actually to make, to actually sit down and make du'a for the people that are hurting you. So sit down and do that. And then the reflection is, take a minute and think about how that made your own heart feel. Maybe send that person a gift that you have grudges towards. How did that make your own heart feel? Did it feel differently? Are you feeling more connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are your prayers opening up for you? How is how are you growing and helping yourself in that way? And then, of course, the more we do that, the more we as a community will come together in beautiful ways and be the community we are meant to be. The community that enjoins and promotes and uplifts beauty and goodness and pushes back against all that is ugly and harmful. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Subhanallah. All right. Well, um, I'll open this up now for for uh, questions or comments or anything that anybody would like. Either in Clubhouse, if you would like to raise your hand, you're welcome to. Or on Insta, if you would like to uh, write a question in the comment box, and I'll take a look at it or a comment. I'm happy to respond for the next five or ten minutes before we close off and go off to the rest of our beautiful Friday. Inshallah, it will be a beautiful Friday that you are shedding grudges like leaves shed tree sorry, sorry. like trees shed leaves in the fall we're in the fall right now that's why i was thinking about leaves they're so beautiful it's on the line they're all falling we want to get rid of our all of our grudges and the the third thing here is also spiritual standstill so remember that our grudges hold us back question how do you forgive someone who has passed away I, same way that you forgive someone who's alive, you remember, you say to yourself, they didn't know that unresolved trauma, this is where they were, this is, you know, try to find ways that uh, you can make excuses for them. You can make dua for them with Allah as well, now that they are in that, in the space where they await their day of judgment. You can make dua for them. And really the same, like, it's really the same steps. It's just that we can't have a conversation with them. And then next, the next question is, how do we reconcile this with Allah not requiring us to forgive those who have harmed us? What if I don't have an active grudge, but I refuse to forgive severe injustice abuse? Great question. I do think there's a difference between saying that thing is okay and I forgive you, if that makes sense. So... And maybe it's because we're using the English language that we are, that we're struggling in this space. But when I am working to get rid of my grudge, I am working to remove the power that a person who has harmed me, remove that power from the space that it has in my life. But I'm not deciding that it's okay, no problem. It's a it's pardoned and washed away, okay. I, and so, the we can on the day of judgment when the blessings actually something that gives us comfort is that if somebody has oppressed us or harmed us on the day of judgment, we can take from their we can take from their good deeds, and if they run out, we can give them our bad, bad deeds, and we 
like I'm sure all of us would like to have that opportunity, but we don't want the opposite opportunity. Like if we've been nasty to someone, we don't want anybody to come and take our own good deeds. So, you know, there's a place there of balance too, right? There's a place there of balance. But I think most important is this issue here, that for not having a grudge, not carrying ugliness inside, burning grudges, which affect how we feel about our life, is different than saying it's okay that that thing happened. I hope that that, I hope that's clear. How do you protect yourself from bad energy while being available for them for the sake of Allah? Also a really good question. You need, a, you need worship and ibadah to strengthen you so that you are the one who's strong in the room and not them. So that in the room, they, their energy is not overcoming your energy, so to speak. Your energy has to be the stronger energy. Oh, also an interesting question. Isn't it true that uh, first equals No, no, it's is how the narration that I know goes. Um, I no, I would say no that this uh, that this particular hadith has, has a number of layers of meaning, and one of them is what makes you a strong believer. Does it, Allah, the Prophet said, has taught us that what makes you a strong believer is not being able to punch somebody out or to, um, maybe I'm misunderstanding your question also. You know, I think I might be misunderstanding the question now that I reread it. But the idea of a strong believer is better than a weak believer has many layers of meaning. And one of them is strong belief. And the place we get strong belief is from exiting ourselves away from bitterness and the control of shaitan. And the other thing that you have there, and I don't know exactly how you mean them to be related, is that the blessing of one bad deed is only equal to one bad deed. Whereas when we do a good deed with Allah, it has more. But all of that is with Allah, not with people. With people, we, have, we are accountable for what we do to, for them and to them. We are rewarded, but we're also accountable if we hurt people. That's a different, that's a different uh, space. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I did. The, the strong believer, Ahabu ilallah, is more beloved to God than the weak believer. And so that has been interpreted in many different ways, physically, spiritually, etc. And the idea is that the, the, I used to say that to myself when I was exercising. Just keep repeating it to myself because I hate exercise. So like if I was walking or doing something that I, I just keep telling myself, but of course it has many multiple layers of meaning as well. All right. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a beautiful day. It's Friday. So it's a really good opportunity to wash our heart of bitterness and grudges and move away from them. It's a great opportunity to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and turn in with a full heart and a full readiness to move forward on this path and not be in a spiritual standstill anymore. So may Allah bless you all and help you all and open doors for all of you. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma ahdina wa 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 